I am from Amnesty International, and so I want to set the, what I'm going to say in the context of um, Amnesty and the Human Rights Framework. Um, we work in the context of all the international human rights standards, and obviously the main one for what we're talking about today is the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, um, sometimes known as the Women's Convention or CEDAW. The UK is a signatory to this convention, and indeed there is only a very small handful of states anywhere in the world that are not signing up to this uh, convention. Ir um, Iran, funnily enough, alongside the US are two of the states that haven't signed up. Even Saudi Arabia has signed the CEDAW convention, uh, although with many reservations and a poor record in implementation. But it's a powerful and important convention, and it's very clear in this convention that signatories to the convention have a proactive obligation to tackle cultural, religious, or traditional practices that are harmful to women. Culture, religion, and tradition can never be used as an excuse uh, to commit abuses of, uh, of women's human rights. When I say honour crimes, I should just define what we mean. It's, it's not a nice term. It sounds like we're legitimising the crime, but we do actually need to have a special name for it, as I will explain later. What I mean when I say honour crimes are crimes of violence against women. Not necessarily only murder, it can include shaving the head, cutting the nose off, slashing or disfiguring the face, imprisonment and beating. But the ones we most commonly hear about is murder. They, these are crimes of violence against women, and it's because the women are being punished by the family or the community. They are being punished for actually, or even only allegedly, um, undermining what the family or the community believe to be the correct code of behaviour for women. In transgressing this perceived correct code of behaviour, she shows she has not been properly controlled to conform by her family, and that is seen as the shame or the dishonour to the family. Um, the other thing we always have to restate again and again is that honour crimes are not specific to any one culture or any one community. There's a tremendous tendency, particularly in the UK and in the climate of the war on terror, to conflate Islam with some of the extreme <coughs> forms of violence against women such as honour crimes, such as forced marriage. But it's very clear that honour crimes has a long and disreputable history across several um, cultures and backgrounds. They've been found in Romani communities in various parts of Europe. They've been found in Muslim communities, Hindu communities, Sikh communities, Catholic and other Christian communities, and in fact occur quite commonly also in certain parts of Europe and in South America. And in several countries around the world, the, the legal system itself recognises honour as a valid, a valid defence, partial or complete, for a crime of honour. Um, so notably Peru, Bangladesh, Argentina, Ecuador, Egypt, Guatemala, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon and the occupied territories, and Venezuela, all have codified in their law a partial or a complete defence to a, an assault or a murder in the name of honour. Just to be clear about why it's important to be clear in the terms that we use, whilst there are in the UK and in every culture examples of men who are upset when, um, when he's rejected by a relationship and he takes his vengeance by killing the woman or the children, we get lots of that in the UK, that is slightly different to an honour crime. In an honour crime, the whole family, or vast majority of the family, will think it is a good idea. They may well conspire, all of them, to do it. And then once it has been done, they will equally all conspire, or the majority of them conspire, to cover it up. And they will furthermore often be very proud of what they've done. So it has a slightly different context, which is why there is a need to have some other name for it, so-called honour crimes. Because if we don't know how to recognise it and how to identify it, then we're not going to be able to prevent it and we're not going to be able to take appropriate measures to deal with it. We need better information, better statistics, better responses, and that means we need to know how to identify these cases. Um, the statistics is the question we always get asked, how many cases are there, and of course we don't know. Um, in 2000, the United Nations report suggested that there were some 5,000 such crimes across the world every year. Other figures would be much higher than that. In Pakistan alone, they claim that there are some 4,000 such cases a year. So we really don't know. A recent UN report highlighted um, that all forms of violence against women, and in fact, um, Amnesty's own recent report, Iraq, five years on, also highlighted that all forms of violence against women, including honour crimes, were significantly on the increase in Iraq. Now, there's all sorts of reasons for this, and it's difficult to pinpoint one more than another. 
Obviously, there's a general air of lawlessness and insecurity, which allows for violence to breed. Um, however, in the situation in Iraq, there have opened up gaps and vacuums that allow different factions to come in and step in, all with their particular version of how women should behave, and all in insisting on enforcing that. And it has allowed those um, increasingly higher standards uh, of control of women to be played off against one another, and it's created a situation that allows that to happen. We also know from history that in situations of times of war and conflict, um, peoples who feel that they are in some way under attack will often become even more conservative in their own population because their identity and their sense of, uh, of um, who they are is actually translated through who their women are and how their women behave. So it's very common that uh, cultures will get more conservative and therefore more controlling and restrictive of women whilst they are in a situation of conflict. It is also the case, of course, that um, during conflict, um, issues like women's rights drop off the agenda. They're the bit that can be traded. They're the negotiable bit. It's a luxury. It's a bonus. It's too complicated. We'll deal with it later. It's too sensitive. We'll come back to the women. As though it's something separate, whereas it's not. It's something integral. But that is how women's rights get traded further and further down the agenda, allowing violence to flourish, violence against women to flourish with impunity. Just to move quickly on to the UK, in the UK, again, we don't know the scale of the problem. In 2004, the Met Police cited some 12 cases, but they realised that between 2003 and 2005, the Met Police had 518 forced marriage cases, and there's a direct link, obviously, between forced marriage and honour crimes. And they say that they have two incidents a week of honour-related violence, not necessarily murder, but honour-related violence. In, in London, two incidents a week. Between 1996 and 2006, they had confirmed some 25 cases of honour killings, but they realised that this is a massive underestimation. One of the problems with honour crimes is that the people who you would normally expect to be fighting for a family member who has been killed are the family, but it's actually the family who've committed the crime. So there's a very low reporting rate uh, and there's very low levels of cooperation. So actually, who is ever going to actually report this killing? And very often you'll find there are situations of suicide or unfortunate accidents, whether it's here in the UK or whether it's overseas, which again, go unreported. And often when you look into those family histories, there's a troubled history that could signify something of an honour crime related nature. So there's a very low reporting rate. And um, however, what the Met Police have recently said in 2004 is they're going to review a further 109 cases just in London alone as may have been honour crimes that they didn't recognise at the time. And again, this is why it's important that we know how to recognise these crimes and how to prevent them. I'm going to skip over some of what I've got to say because we've got a lot of people to listen to tonight. Um, I think there's a couple of points I do want to make and one I've already alluded to already. For women who are facing honour crimes or forced marriage, um, it's already extremely difficult for them to seek help and to come out and be able to talk about what's happening in their family and in their community, to be able to trust people, to have somewhere safe to go. It's extremely difficult for any women in that situation. It's particularly difficult for women who are of a uh, Muslim background as well, especially at the moment in the time of this war on terror. There is this conflation in the agendas of uh, controlling immigration, of counter-terrorism, <coughs> And then we've got to trying to prevent women from uh, suffering violence. And there are many young women who would already find it difficult to turn to the police or to social services to escape from a forced marriage or from an honour crime. But if they thought that in doing so, the police are going to think in their heads, oh, they're extreme fundamentalist Muslim families, so probably they're terrorists. I'll go and raid their house. It's going to be even harder then for that girl to come out and seek help. So I think we have to be very wary uh, where there are conflations of these differing um, policy agendas in the UK. 